I think if he played in this day and age, he would have been one of the greatest players ever to play football. But people didn't understand him and people just thought he was very ungrateful, you know, and he could put it about as well. You know, for the size of him, you know, he would say, I'll see you after, you know, and he would walk in the lounge and look for the player. Yeah. And go, let's go. He said, uh, I'll be interested in bringing you down and we'll meet for a couple of years, sir. And I just said, where are you, Harry? And he went, I'm manager at Portsmouth now. And I said, well, what are they like? And he went, they're f***ing, sir. Hi, I'm Jeff Stillinger. This is Football's Greatest. Each week, I'll be sitting down with a legend to discuss and debate some of the best exponents of the beautiful game. The players that got you off your seat, the hard men that made you wince, and the moments that will stay with you for life. In this episode, we're discussing Mavericks with a man who is one of the best creators and finishers the Premier League has ever seen. I've spent years with him on Soccer Saturday and we have argued together and we've laughed together and on occasion we've almost cried together and he brings a vitality to television that he used to bring to the football pitch as well. Harry Redknapp, who he's worked with a lot, said of him, I love Paul Merson, he is special to me. He'll always be special, and I'm great friends with him now. He's had his issues, and I probably treated him a bit differently to the rest of them. Understatement. Mm -hmm. But they didn't mind because he was special. Merce, thanks Pleasure. for joining us, mate. Pleasure. Pleasure. Big tribute from Harry there. Yeah, uh, yeah I love Harry. I think he was unbelievable for me. Great manager, great man, and, and still a very good friend, which is which is nice. And I think that's what it's all about in football. If you stay friends with people, yeah. it's even more of a bonus. Yeah, and of course, we had years on Soccer Saturday yeah. uh, as well. I, I remember you, you telling me. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I remember telling you telling me it was sort of the nearest thing in a way when you finished playing to uh, a football dressing room. You've still got that little team ethos. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. I mean, you know, someone like me with my addictions, it helped me immensely with Soccer Saturday with the lads because... When you're coming towards the end, you know you're getting worse. You know, it's, there's there's an art in trying to get out the right time. And that was it. At the end, it I just, it was that 10 minutes before training, that 10 minutes after training in the dressing room. And when that goes, you, you know, that's when it gets a bit lonely. And with, with Sky, with Tomo, Tiz, Charlie and yourself, we had that, you know what I mean? Everybody used to fly into work at 9, 10 o'clock and we'd all be laughing and joking for ages. So, yeah, massive. That was a massive help for me. Yeah. Was, was it important to you as well to have that same, you know, sort of popularity um, with the public that you had when you're playing? You haven't sort of fallen off the end of a cliff. One week you're performing in front of, you know, thousands and thousands of fans and the next week you're not. I mean, that, that didn't happen because of the show. Uh, to be fair, I ended up playing for Tamworth. I mean, ah. you can't, <laughs> there weren't 25,000 at that game. Uh, yeah, I, I know what you mean. I mean, the, the buzz, I, I, I talk as the buzz, you know, I have a buzz as much on a Saturday going in and working, you know, I say work, watching football and t talking about what I know. So that was the thing. I never had that buzz and then it stopped and I struggled. It carried on straight away with Sky straight after, which was great. When you said playing for Tamworth, was that an exaggeration? Mm -hmm. was, was Tamworth the one that you, you walked out of when you were on the bench? Yeah, they <laughs> put me sub after. You know, I'm not a big time Charlie or a Jack the Lab, but I'm not being sub for Tamworth. I mean, that was the last result. Yeah. And the manager wants me going on 2 0 down with 10 men against the best team in the league, Gray's Athletic. So, no, that yeah. was it. I finished <laughs> after that. So, we're going to talk about Mavericks. Um, and I think we should probably qualify what we're meaning in terms of mad Mavericks. And I, I think it's someone who's probably a, a free spirit, somebody who's a bit different, who's unique, individual skills, so, a one-off, if you like, which I think covers a pretty broad spectrum of, of people. And we'll come to whether you were one or not in a moment. But, I mean, to bang on again about Soccer Saturday, did we have any Mavericks? I can think of one who you'd put in that category. I, I would I'd definitely say Charlie Nicholas, 100%. I think, yeah, I, I, I would say Charlie more. Tiz was a different sort of maverick. I would say both. I would say both, really. But one was different to the other. One, you would say a maverick because more off-field, if I'm being honest. Do you know what I mean? With Charlie, you know, I read a thing the other day about Charlie. You know, nicknamed Champagne Charlie. He doesn't even like champagne. But because he was a maverick and, and he's stuck. And, but, and then Tiz was the other way round. He was more a player on the pitch. Maverick, yeah, Maverick in where he played, if you know what I mean. You know, I'd 
he's my mate. He's a good mate of mine. But I think you need to be doing it. At the, you know, that's why he didn't play for England so many times because he was playing for Southampton. It's that's facts. You know, he'll be the first to say that. But that's what happens. You know, mm. you, you need to be playing for the top four or five teams in the country and playing under pressure, severe pressure, week in, week out. When I play for Arsenal, for instance, you're under severe pressure. You know, I was with Ray Parley yesterday and was talking and he was saying you always had to be fit because if you weren't fit, you lost your place and I don't know when you're getting back in. You probably allowed two games, two bad games at Arsenal or a top club. When I went to other clubs, people say, I played my best football at Aston Villa, Middlesbrough. I, I knew I was playing. You know, I knew I could flick a ball here, flick a ball there and if it didn't come off, I'm playing next week. You know, at Arsenal, that wasn't the case and that's why... When people go, oh, people don't play because they're not playing for one of the top five teams in the country, it's because they have to play under severe pressure. Yeah. That's what it is. It's under playing under severe pressure every week. I'm going to give you a quote from Cesc Fabregas, Merce, who says, all the coaches now talk about the pattern of play, but special talent is dying because of it. From a very young age, boys are being told what to do and they are teaching plans for the game. Coaches prefer this strategy instead of players using their own intuition. Mm. Is he right? Do, don't we still get players who do their own thing? And I, I'm thinking of one in particular, maybe not so much now, but Jack Grealish. It's certainly at Villa, did his own thing, didn't he? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, at Villa, he was, he, he was a maverick in a way of just go out and win the game for us. You do what you want to do. And we'll work around you. No disrespect to Aston Villa, but that's what happens that when you're not in a top four or five team, if you know what I mean. Like, that's what... Tiz was... Jack Grealish exactly the same as Tiz at Villa at Southampton. You go to Man City and then it's a different game. You know, you've got, you got to play to the team. You've got to... And, you know, and that... And I think Jack's... I, think, I don't think Jack's changed too much. I think he's got the respect now. You know, that's why I always talk about people like Ryan Giggs and people like that. They were doing it for 10 seasons on the trot, you know, every every all the time. And that's why I have a big thing for the Man United youngsters because they just kept on producing. And that's what, when you're playing at Man City, you need to keep on performing. Do you, is there, can you play your own way now? I don't know. Kevin De Bruyne does, doesn't he? Mm. I think so. I think, I think they play a way for Kevin De Bruyne to get on the ball to make things happen. I think there's a way of playing football to say, right, we're going to play this way, that way, get him in the hole and let him, you know, be able to put, put the ball through the eye of a needle. And there's other players like your Rod Riz who are going to be sitting there who are going to just keep it ticking over. No spills or frills. Get the ball, roll it, play it. For me, th th he's the best in the world at doing that. So... Even though he's not a maverick, he's still the best in the world at playing his position. Hmm. So it's a hard one. I, you know, I, I, I was, I, I played in the park. You know, I played in the park. So I just went out and played. I, I don't think we'll. I've, I've said this how many years ago? Six, seven, eight years. Ago, I don't think we'll see another Joe Cole. I don't think we'll see another Joe Cole. So, do you yeah, I, 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 I half agree with him. I half agree hmm. with him. Yeah, I do. I half agree with him. Where you ha you have to play and you have to play a shape, you know. I think growing up, you don't have a position when you're growing up. You don't have a position. My boy's at Chelsea now, so he plays here, there, 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 you know, and they all play everywhere. There's no good being all right in four positions. If you're not unbelievable in one position, you ain't making jack shit. Hmm. You ain't making it. You know that's fact, and that's what I don't get. Everybody goes, we don't produce a holding midfield player. You know, and we, we a Jorginho or a Rodri and a Makaleli and people like that. You know, Declan Rice is the only one. He's one of a kind. I mean, we ain't got any of them. You know, and and that that's the problem because we don't play that position. Instead of playing that position, we play, we work from wingers to fullback. So it's it's a thing. If you're not a winger, well, you can go back to fullback. You know, so you're taking your chance. I, 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 I don't, I, I don't dis, I don't, I, I agree with him in a way, and I do because people play in different positions. You have to be unbelievable in one position. It's like it's all right having two good feet. I didn't. I had one good foot. I, Huddleston was a hundred times better with two feet than me. But who, who, yeah. who had the better career? Because I had, I had, I had an unbelievable one foot. 
we're going to talk about somebody who is absolutely brilliant in one position in, in just a moment. I just want to round the Jack Grealish stuff off, though, by saying, mm. you know, until we talk about Mavericks and things, I think one thing that makes him a Maverick still, and Pep will not like it, is that he still makes the front pages of the newspapers as well as the back pages mm. for some of the things he does off the field. But when we talked a while ago about... <clears throat> You know, being one of the gang, being a normal sort of person and, and for the fans relating to you. I'm telling you that my boy, one of my boys, Matt, um, big football fan, uh, Villa had been playing in London that day. Jack wasn't playing. It was a Saturday. Jack wasn't playing. My boy was out in London early Saturday evening and he bumped into Jack Grealish in the bar. Didn't know him from Adam. Went over and introduced himself. You know, can I have a photo? Of course you can. Um, you know, and, and then... Matt and Jack are talking for the next 10 or 15 minutes, mm. you know? And I think that's the sort of thing that sets him aside from others. Oh, 100%. 100%. He, he's he's what you call a good lad, a mm. good, good lad. You know, you, you even see like like the other week with the the, the, the poor kid who, who couldn't... Who, who, partially blind yeah you know standing there you know he went put his time out you know he's got a heart of gold i mean yeah i would i'd call him a maverick still yeah but definitely because he he's back back page front page and everybody's interested in what he does everybody's interested <laughs> you know i'm interested in what he does i want him to do well i'm not a man city fan but i want jack Grealish to do well you know i think he's a he's a good good lad i'm my boy when he signed for chelsea last like got offered to sign for chelsea you know he loves Jack Grealish, you know, and I said to Tim, do us a favour, try and get a message. Within 10 minutes, message sent through. Message to Freddie, well done, Freddie, signing. Hopefully you come up whenever you want to Man City, watch a game, come and see me after. You know, yeah. Class, you know, you could ask other people, they wouldn't do that. Now, thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube. But can I ask you please to hit that subscribe button? That way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show. I'm going to move on to some of the players that you played with. And you said there, back page and front page. Well, that certainly refers to this fella. Um, and it was somebody who got bums off seats and everybody was talking about constantly. And it's Gazza, of course, poor Gascoigne. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's talk about him on the pitch, first of all. What, what sort of set him apart on the pitch? Being that good. <laughs> he was head and shoulders above everybody, in my opinion. You know, he, his balance, his awareness, he could see things very comfortable on the ball. In them days, he didn't really get that, you know, them tricks and things like that, you know, the way he could hold people off and, and cut back and do Cruyff's. You know, I know Johan Cruyff, but he used to do it 100 mile an hour, Gazza, as well. He'd be running in, bang. In training, no one would go near him in England. He would leave you on your backside. You know, there's as I always talk about standards, there's always, you know, uh, up here and then there's the next level and the next level and he was right up there right up there in my opinion if he didn't get injured I thought 1990 he was the best in the world that's some doing mm. to be one of the best in the world in a sport that every country plays you know some doing would a coach accept him in this day and age knowing that he was a bit off the wall and being aware of all the things that came with him no chance <laughs> Not a chance. No, no, I, I, I don't think so. I, I, I really don't. I think, I think the way it is now, you have to live a different life today. You have to. It's just the way it is. It's you know. You look at the players now. The way the professionalism about them. I, I don't think. You know. I we used to. There was a saying in football. You know. I've heard it with me. Oh, he's high maintenance. He's high maintenance. You know. Harry would say, and people, and George Graham would say, I'm. But you, he performs. So if he if he's eye maintenance, he performs. You keep him. You know, Jules Graham said one day, I, I, I just say when I come out of treatment, he said to me, I said to him, like, and I've been in trouble. I don't know how many times, and he's got, he, you know, he banned, banned me from the club for two weeks, for twice. And I said to him, why, why are you not throwing me out this time? You know, I've just been done with drink and drugs, and and he went, if you have a Rolls Royce and it breaks down, you get it fixed. If you have a Morris Minor and it breaks down, you'll fuck it off. <laughs> so that like to say, you can play. If you couldn't play, you're out. And I think that's the thing. But I think nowadays, I don't think managers would be out of cope with Gaza. I, I think they're so involved in the tactics and the football and the pitch. They don't want that that problem off the pitch. They don't want that problem. You know, they just don't want that situation. I mean, another guy you played with a lot, obviously, was Ian Wright. He's got an opinion, right? He hasn't he? Did, did he always? What was he like in the dressing room? He was the most enthusiastic football player I ever played with. 
Like, if he scored in training on a Monday morning, you'd have thought he'd just scored the winning goal against Tottenham. Honestly, he would run off, slide on his knees. Every He enjoyed it. I've never seen him come into training with the ump. He always loved playing football. He's got to be one of the best finishers I've seen. He was unique to other people. People will go, oh, you know, Alan Shearer, you know, 200 and something goals. Ian Wright was different. You know, Ian Wright, we could be under the cosh in a game, clear the ball up front to the halfway line. He would beat two players and chip the goalie. You know, I don't know too many players when I was playing that could do that, you know, and he could put it about as well. You know, for the size of him, you know, he would say, I'll see you after, you know, and he would walk in the lounge and look for the player yeah, and go, let's go. And they go, what, what? And they go, well, you, you told me you wanted to do it after the game. Let's go. Like, I've never seen anybody do that. I've seen players square up and go, I'll see you after. And they, they're they all cuddling and kissing each other after the game. Not right. Unbelievable. He was, and he was going to rip my head off one day at Forest away because I never passed him the ball. I don't know what happened. I went through and I shot and he said, you should have passed. And I just went, oh, F off, right? And he went ballistic. I mean, ballistic at the highest level. But he was a winner. He was a winner. I couldn't talk highly enough of Ian Wright. I, you know, he's one of my favourite players to play with, without a doubt. I, mean, I remember working with him not so long ago now, and, and we were doing a, a commercial with um, with Wrighty, Paddy McGuinness and me, and it had gone for two days, and it was sort of seven o'clock in the evening on the second day, and we'd done a hundred takes of the last shot, and the director said, we'll just do it one more time, and Wrighty just exploded. <laughs> he said, no, we fucking won't. You've got it. That's it. That's a wrap. Come on, boys. We're out of here. And of course, me and Paddy were hugging him, you know, it was fantastic. Uh, so I imagine in the dressing room, I mean, he had some clashes with Bruce Rioch, didn't he? So I yeah. guess he had to be a pretty good man manager to look after him. Yeah, he couldn't cope with him. Couldn't cope with Wrighty. No, he was he come come Bruce was a hard man as well. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, when he played as well, he was a hard man. But he couldn't get Wrighty. Wrighty didn't have him. They clashed all the time. You know, I think the day when he told Wrighty that John McGinley would have scored that goal, that I think that was the last straw. <laughs> yeah, and that was it with Wright. He didn't he, he weren't having Bruce at all. <laughs> not one, not even a little bit after that. He was sitting next to me and he went, Who's John McGinley? And I went, He plays for Bolton. And he went, <laughs> What? <laughs> and he he got up, he took his clothes off, he walked to the thing, and Bruce Rock was going, Where are you going? On? And he just went, Fuck off. And he just walked and had a shower and that was it. He was he had it with him. He was like, he had a massive opinion, but he could, right, he could carry it out. Honestly, I, I couldn't, he's he's probably the best centre forward I ever played with. And I play, I, you know, I play with Shearer, Shearer, you know, and I mean, his goal scoring record talks for itself. But right, he's just, right, he had every goal in the locker, every single goal in the locker. He, he would play against Des Walker and Des Walker would have him in his pocket every minute of the game. And he began, right, he began, I will get a chance, Des. I'll get a chance, Des. And he would like score last. He would always score against him. And then we'd play against other teams. And he would be going, give us the ball, Mercy. Shit. Look, he's shit. He's shitting himself. The centre half. The centre half's going. Like, he ain't got a clue what he's talking about. And he would just like dominate players. He would he was so confident. I, I never had that confidence. You know, even when he had the worst game in the world, he knew he was going to score a goal. So let's just get this clear, because the BBC boys wouldn't forgive me if I didn't just have you put this on the record. Ian Wright was better than Alan Shearer, in your view. Yeah, a better footballer. Okay. Oh, yeah. A better footballer. You know, different players in a way, but Alan Shearer was like a more of a target man, strong, you know, go through, and he... He was very physical, very strong, harder than what people... I don't know if people thought, but he was really hard. Like, I, I played against him and centre-halves have and gone... To, and he was solid, scored goals. But he wasn't going to beat two players from the halfway line. Do you know what I mean? He just wasn't that kind of player. You know, I, I would I would go with Ian Wright. Okay. I think Ian Wright would be disappointed he never got the caps he did. Look, just before we move on to some of your favourites, um, I just want to mention one more player. Uh, Stan Collymore. I mean... Great player, a sort of complex character though, was he? Yeah, I mean, I played with Stan. I played with Stan. I sat next to Stan in, in the dressing room and one day he would talk to you for an hour and the next day he'd walk in, he'd walk through you like Patrick Swayze in Ghost. He would literally walk straight through you and you're like, we were talking yesterday. And no one really understood. He, he struggled with depression. I think if he played in this day and age, he would have been one of the greatest players ever to play football. 
He was six foot two, six foot three. He was big, he was strong, he was quick. He could head the ball, he could hit with both feet. He was a good finisher, but people didn't understand him and people just thought he was very ungrateful. And, and that wasn't the case. He was, he was an ill person who needed to get well. And I think if he played today, he would. we'd be talking about him forever and ever. Mm. And that, I thought he was that good. Was mental health a thing at all in those days? No, no, nah, nah. It was not, not really. You know, it was. Let's be honest. More people looked at him for being ungrateful than than being ill, in my opinion. And then my mate, when I just got to pop in the bit in this pub to pick some to give someone some money or pick some money up, and he went, "Just go in." I said, "I can't." He went, "Just go in. We'll just go and have a coke." I said, "I can't. I just can't walk into a pub." And I went in and I got out there at five in the morning. Oh. And the manager absolutely slaughtered me after the game. He brought me off and he said, you lot should, you should beat him up. So look, let's move on to some of your favourite players. And people might not regard all of these necessarily as, as mavericks, but let's talk about one or two. And I'm, I'm really interested with your first choice because he was by no means the same sort of player mm. or personality as you are, for instance. We're talking about Ray Wilkins. Yeah, Ray Wilkins is my hero. Yeah, God bless him. Yeah, I I'm, grew up a massive Chelsea fan when I was a kid. You know, him being captain at 16, 17 years of age. People say you should never meet your heroes because they'll disappoint you. But, you know, I was fortunate to meet him a lorry load of times. He's such a nice bloke. A special player, yeah, I just, I loved him. You know, I, I, he was one of them players. And he wasn't my guy. He, I didn't play like him. I didn't, you know, but he was Rolls royce He was elegant. He was, you know, never phased, you know. And he, I always wanted to be him. Always, I always wanted to be. When I met him, I all thought, "I want to be you." You know, he talked so nicely. You met him enough times as well. He was, he was just a class act. You know what I mean? He, people go, "Oh, he went sideways." You know, he was a spider. He went side. The hardest thing in the world in football is keeping the ball, and it's the best trick in the world. You, know, you can have all the tricks and flicking over people's head and all that. The best trick, and it will never change, is passing the ball to a teammate. You know, Roy Keane was exactly the same. You know. They, they pass the ball. You watch Declan Rice. They hardly ever give the ball away, you know, and it's such an art and that's what he had. And it, they give it to players that, that are going to go and win your football matches and that was, that was what he was like. He's a fantastic yeah. man. Um, what about John Barnes? Why have you included him? I, I don't think people realise how good John Barnes was. I honestly don't. I've, you know, they, them three or four years at Liverpool, he was unplayable and I mean unplayable. I mean, he had... The, the way, even at Watford, when he was at Watford, he was phenomenal. But he would run with a ball and he, he'd just put it in enough in front of him. So when someone dived in, he'd just flick it over their foot or over them. I was fortunate to play with him with England and people go, oh, he didn't have the England career. That's why he ain't that great. He didn't play well for England. Believe me, every single time I was in a squad with him or played, every team just stopped him playing. That's all they'd done. They just left two or three players on him and made sure they marked him out the game. And that's how good he was. That's how good. Phenomenal. Went past players, glided past players for fun. You know, proper, proper player. Yeah. Sometimes people have short memories how good people are. You know, people will probably go, oh, he couldn't play now. Couldn't play now. He'd easily be out of play now. There's no, I ain't seen any wingers that are better than him today. Today, I haven't seen anybody better than him. He's a character as well, which we know. Yeah. You can see now, because you try stopping stopping him seeing the Anfield rap and oh, any, yeah, anything know. you go yeah. to, you, you know? <laughs> it's absolutely brilliant. When you talk about Mavericks, you know, it's a bit surprising here because you put David Beckham yeah. down. Um, but but he, well, one thing he did do is he had the X factor, didn't he? Oh, I, I, for me, the best crosser of a ball the world's ever seen, in my opinion. I thought his crossing was brilliant. I think before that you had... Robinson, uh, John Robinson at Nottingham Forest, who was phenomenal crosser of a ball. But David Beckham, for me, in my era, was was phenomenal. So underrated. And I mean, that might sound a bit silly because he's gone and played for Real Madrid and had the career he had, but I still don't think he gets the credit he deserves. I thought he was phenomenal footballer, big game player. You know, I think sometimes you look at players... Big game players score big goals in big football matches. You know, turns up in World Cups. You know, the free kick against Greece to take us to the world. You know, big game players. You know, the thing about the free kick against Greece is, I think, remember sitting watching it, and I don't want you. I expected him to score. I, I oh. expected him to score because he was that good. Yeah, everybody jumped up. I was watching it. Everybody jumped up, but I was sitting there thinking, "Fuck." Because I'd backed us to win the game and two all draws, <laughs> no good. Do you know what I mean? So, but every time he had a free kick, I never thought he'd miss. You know, never. I, I played against him at 
when I was at uh, Old Trafford and I was in the war, I don't know if it was for Villa or Portsmouth, and he put one, oh, it was Portsmouth, he put one in the far corner. Yeah, I couldn't talk highly enough of him. Top player. And to bounce back from the World Cup in 98, when I've seen players get stick. I've seen players get stick. I've never seen anything like that in my footballing career. You know, what was happening off the pitch, in the papers, to show the strength, the mental strength that he's shown is I, I just, honestly I just couldn't talk highly enough of the bloke, and and I don't really know him. I'm you know I've met him a couple of times, but and I played with him, but he was quite shy. But I couldn't talk. I, you just can't understand how good he was. He was that that good, in my opinion. We talk about Mavericks, and I'm thinking, if you, you know, I'm older than you. I know that's surprising, but you know. <laughs> Rodney Marsh, I'm thinking, yeah. you know, yeah. um, you know, because Rodney never cared, never cared a jot about what people thought about him. You know, Stan Bowles, yeah, and the stories of Stan Bowles were, were oh, legendary. Yeah. Being being in a betting shop in Shepherd's Bush at half past two on a yeah. match day, but being on the field at three o'clock, yeah. you know, I'm um, thinking Tony Curry, Alan Hudson was another one. You know, it was a He's a fantastic player. I'm sure you liked him when he was playing for, yeah, for Chelsea. Was, yeah, you know? he was when he was at Chelsea. And my dad talks about him, you know, and yeah. Steve Bowl talked about him very highly when because he was at Stoke, you know. So yeah, players yeah. like that. I mean, and, he, and you miss the best out of all time, which is you know, my dad says the best player he's ever seen is Georgie Best. Mm. You know, so you know, I always think you know you go through them players that you just said. There's not many of them that haven't had a problem. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's. it's there's, that's what I think with a Maverick. I think sometimes it's it's what people relate to. People relate. People off the pitch relate to the player on the pitch, and that's what they look for. Let, let's talk about some foreign players, shall we? Because a, a lot of Mavericks, I think it's fair to say, have been you know overseas players. I was going to say foreign imports, but not all of them played in this country. And I know one particular player you think is is one of the best ever. Was Diego Maradona? I, 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 he's my favourite player of all time. I, I, I love Diego Maradona. Don't love him for handballing the ball, but it's going to say you're allowed to say that as an Englishman. You know? Yeah, I, you know. I mean, the other goal is the greatest goal I've ever seen in football. The greatest goal I've ever seen, in my opinion, to do what you do in a World Cup against a very good England team. You know, people forget England were one of the big teams in that World Cup to get the ball on the halfway line and go past four or five players, and then. I still don't know how he goes around the best goalkeeper in the world and doesn't touch it with his other foot. It's near on impossible to do what he did. He was unbelievable. You know, he won the World Cup near on his own. It's very rare you can do that. You know, he goes to Napoli, which is probably the equivalent at the time of probably going to Sheffield United and winning the league. You know, in the hardest league in the world where you get kicked from pillar to post. You know, if anybody has an opportunity, just go on YouTube and just watch his warm up and he's playing keeping the ball up and he's just keeping the ball up it's packed the stadium people were turning up just to watch his warm up and he's hitting the ball into the stars and bringing it down on his foot and it's it doesn't move it's i, I honestly again one footed one footed you know people go to me oh you got to be two footed you got to be two footed you got to kick with the other foot you know the two two of the three greatest players ever to play football in my era were both most one-sided footballers ever in Diego Maradona and Messi. You know, so, you know, I always say, people go, oh, you've got to be two foot, you've got to be two foot. No, have one unbelievable foot and two all right feet. Because if you've got two all right <laughs> feet, you won't make it. Yeah. You won't. I think the thing about Maradona as well, he's not alone in this, but I think when he was on the football field, I wouldn't say it was a re release for him, but he was under so much pressure in his life all the time, particularly in Naples when he was in Napoli, where he couldn't put a foot outside the door because he was he was just mm. mobbed. So to cope with all of that mentally is amazing, really. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely relate to that. Not the, the coming out, but all the problems off the pitch. As soon as I crossed that white line on a Saturday, I just went out and played. That was my release for an hour and a half. And I see that with Diego Maradona is like, Oh, I can just do what I want now for an hour and a half. Nothing's going to happen. You know, all the drama's going to be when it finishes this game. But why I'm on the pitch. And that's why I tried stuff. I used to try that killer ball and all the lads used to go, stop playing that Hollywood ball. And, you know, I try and chip the goalie and George would go, what are you chipping the goalie for? You don't get two goals for that. Just put it in the net. And like, but I just, 
I just want to go out and enjoy it. And if it didn't go right and the fans are calling me every name under the sun or whatever, or they were booing or whatever, I'd think, well, that's not even half my problems what I got when I cross when I walk off this pitch, you know, and, and I see that with Diego Maradona. I'm not putting myself in the same breath, but I can relate. I can relate to that that hour and a half of bliss, that hour and a half of I'm just going to go out and play. And if it doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world because you ain't going to believe the trouble I'm in when I get off this pitch. <laughs> Look, there are so, so many overseas players we can talk about. Paolo Di Canio. Hmm. I mean, he was an enigma, wasn't he? Because, you know, one week he could be pushing the referee over <laughs> and the next week he's catching the ball because the opposition goalkeeper is down injured and instead of putting the ball in the back of the net, he's like the ultimate sportsman. I, he, yeah. he was hard to understand. Yeah, very much so. I, I would call him a maverick if I'm being honest. 100%. I think he was a, a very special player. As you say, you didn't know what he was going to get, you know, and then he goes and scores the volley as well. You know, I mean, I still see that goal now. I think, how can you score from there? It's near on impossible. I don't, don't even know how someone even tries it. Yeah, I don't think Stuart Pearce was too happy when he caught that ball, no. if I'm being honest. But I don't think Harry was neither. But yeah, <laughs> but yeah, I, a phenomenal footballer, very talented. All the players you're saying and that you've mentioned are gifted footballers. The gifted footballers. You know, that they, they wasn't, you know, when Fabregas says about, you know, academies and, they, and coaches are squashing out, coaches didn't teach them. They didn't teach them. They had that, you know, and, and that's why these players, all of these players you're talking about were given a God-given, a God-given gift. And some of them you talked about were given something else as well that, you know, like an addiction or something mm -hmm. that you wouldn't swap. But at the same time, you know, I'd, I'd take that to have the career I had, if I'm being honest. Would you? Yeah. Oh, 100%. I don't, don't get me wrong. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, especially people that have never played football. But to be able to, play at the standard I played at and have the career I did, I would take it. But I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't wish it on anybody who wasn't a footballer. But but success as a footballer outweighs everything else that happened and to there, you in your life. There's no buzz. There's no buzz like it. There's no buzz. You know, scoring a goal in front of 40,000, 30,000 people, even playing in front of 100,000 at Wembley. I mean, there's no buzz. The problem was I didn't. I didn't understand that. I I couldn't stop that buzz. You know, so soon as that game finished and Alan Smith went home to his wife or Sanso went home to their wife and kids, I needed to stay up there. I couldn't understand why I could, and that's what I and that's that's what I imagine with the other players that we were talking about. They couldn't. The buzz was just too much, too much, and they wanted to carry that buzz on. Yeah, and that that's the difference between people. Yeah. I think the same thing in a way might apply to some managers, you know. And I don't want to call Harry Redknapp a maverick, you know. I'm not. I'm not sure Harry would like it, but he was a one-off, wasn't he? I mean, of all the managers you had, would would he be the one you enjoyed playing under the most? And 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 did he understand you best? I mean, the name of the game is winning stuff, you know. I, I won everything at Arsenal, bar in them yeah. days it was the European Cup. So George was very good, an unbelievable manager. An unbelievable manager taught us the game. Probably done our coaching badges on the pitch without even knowing we were doing our coaching badges. You know, if you go through the team, you know we're talking thirty years ago now. Ian Wright's on telly. I'm on telly. Alan Smith's on telly. Perry Groves does the radio. You know, Lee Dixon does the telly. You know, Steve Bowles a manager. Tony Adams has been a manager. You know, all still involved, which is just shows you how good George was. But Harry. Harry was just like the best man manager I've ever, ever, ever played under. And I mean, in a man manager where you'd have thought he just finished playing himself. You know, he knew you, he knew how you were thinking, you knew how he was, you know, he just let you go out and play. But you had to go out and play. You know, he would say, right, just go out and do what you want. I'll get players around you, you know, get the ball to Merce, make runs, he'll find you the ball. But you had to do it. He'd soon let you know if you didn't do it. You know, he wasn't one of them who would go, oh, he's had a shit game, let's just leave. He would go mad at you in the dressing room. He'd pick you out and he'd go, that ain't good enough. You know, he was one of them. He wasn't, he was so strong as a manager. I've, people, When I hear people go, oh, wheeler, dealer, wheeler. He was definitely one of the best managers I played under. And I played under good, good managers. 
good managers, and I would definitely say he was up there without a doubt. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. 100% not. 100% not. You know, 100%. You know, he managed over a 1,000 games. I only not played the following year because I just found my standard of football and I just I just thought I was coming towards the end. I didn't want to embarrass myself and I didn't, you know, and I know Harry would have wanted a bit more and I couldn't give that, but I couldn't talk highly enough of the bloke. Honestly, give me the best year in my footballing career, if I'm being honest, at Portsmouth. How did he persuade you to go there? And no, he rung me up. He said, you've just been released. I'd just been released by Villa, you know, couldn't get into Graham Taylor's team and I understood he wanted legs in the team and I understand that. And I was at home the next day and, Harry rung me up. He said, is that Merce? I said, yeah, when it's Harry Redknapp. And I never talked to him before. And he said, uh, I'll be interested in you bringing him down and we meet for a couple of years, son. And I just said, where are you, Harry? And he went, I'm manager at Portsmouth now. And I said, well, what are they like? And he went, they're fucking shit, son. <laughs> That's exactly how he went. he went. He went, I've got rid of every one of them. I've kept Nigel Quasi. I've got 10 new players on free transfers. He said, I want you to come down, be the captain for a couple of years. We'll give it a right effing go. And I said, Harry, I have to stop you there, mate. I said, I'm living up in the Midlands now. I said, I'm not going to move down for two years and definitely not travelling down every day at my age. I had that at Middlesbrough. He said, I tell you what, son, don't work Mondays, don't work Wednesdays, don't work Fridays, but you fucking make sure you turn it on a Saturday. And I went, I'll be down in the morning, Harry. And I, I, I loved it, honestly. I could not talk highly enough of the club, the players, the fans. And I, I had my best ever game I ever played in. I played, I think, 700 games. The best game I ever played in my whole footballing career was at Millwall Way. We won 5 0, and I got a standing ovation from the Millwall fans. Like, Harry brought me off with five minutes to go, and they all stood up, every one of them. And that's some going. I've played at Millwall a few times. And after the game, I was getting in my car, and an old bloke came up to me about 70 odd years of age. And he said, He said, I've been coming to this ground since I was five, son. I've never seen anybody get that. Yeah. And I always look out for their scores today, always look out for Millwall scores. It's weird, yeah, but I always look out Brilliant. for the scores. I do hope you're enjoying the show. I just want to tell you that you can follow us at, at Football's Greatest Pod on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook. And search for Football's Greatest Pod to find us on X. How, how difficult did you find man management when you had your management spell at, at Walsall? Was it tough? It was tough. It was tough. I, I was drinking and gambling very, very much at the time. And it was just, uh, that's my biggest, that's my only regret in football. My only regret is I thought I'd be a good manager. I thought I'd be a good football manager. I, I worked under a lot of managers. I know the game. I know football. And I'm addicted to football. And I thought I'd be a good manager. And I failed miserably. I should have played myself more. I don't think I lost the game when I was playing. Not because I was a great player then. But I just had experience and could tell the younger players where to go. And yeah, I should have got sacked a lot, lot, lot quicker than what I did, if I'm being honest. The, man, the owner of the club was very kind. He, you know, he tried his hardest to make me succeed, but right place, wrong time, in my opinion. Great club, but drinking and gambling, no good. We're going to finish off by doing a, a quick fire greatest with you. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to name 10 great people or moments from your career. So if we start off with your, it's an interesting one, your greatest manager or coach. George Graham. Your greatest teammate. Perry Groves. Why Perry? He's my best mate in football. Oh. Yeah, he's best man at my wedding. Yeah, he's just just a top bloke. Your greatest opponent? Paolo Maldini. Your greatest goal? I'm going to say Leeds at home in the FA Cup. 2-1, two, 2-0 two down, Ray Parler scored. I scored last kick of the game. We went up to Ellen Road and right, he ripped them apart. We went on and fulfilled a childhood dream of mine to win the FA Cup. Uh, your greatest match? Millwall way okay. for Portsmouth. Yeah, fantastic. Your biggest roller king? Uh, Coventry at home. Uh, first game of the season. P done all pre-season, the whole lot. Went and met my mate in Collindale in the betting shop. Was in the betting shop all day. And then my mate went, I just got to pop in the bet in this pub to pick some, to give someone some money or pick some money up. And he went, Let's just go in. I said, I can't. He went, just go in. We'll just go and have a Coke. I said, I can't. I just can't walk into a pub. And I went in and I got out there at five in the morning. Oh. And I played first game of the season. Mickey, Squin Mickey Quinn scored a hat trick. And the manager absolutely slaughtered me after the game. He brought me off and he said, you lot should, you should beat him up. He's let you down. He was out all last. He was out till six, five o'clock in the morning. And he knew and he still played me. I don't know if the next one's tied in with that as well. But your greatest regret? No management. 
Oh, no, it turned out a good night in the end, the other one. <laughs> it's just a bad result. Uh, <laughs> I didn't know Mickey Quinn was going to get that. Uh, yeah, I, I, would, I, would, I would say management. I, thought, I, I really did think I'd be a good manager. I, I wanted to be a manager from the age of 28. Your greatest roommate. Well, Perry was the only one who would share with me. They put Ray Parler with me for... Ray w went with me for about six months and then he 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 he, he left <laughs> he left and went with Tony and then no one shared with me at night games because I, I afternoon games and away games because I'd all, I'd never I've never slept in the afternoon I, I used to hate night games because it was just a long day I'd get up at eight o'clock in and by the time the game kicked off I, I was exhausted through gambling and everything hmm. uh, greatest moment one moment so greatest moment I'd have to say was playing in the World Cup yeah I just think it's just, just the pinnacle you know to get picked and I was playing in the championship as well which that will never be done again no one will be playing no outfield player will ever play in a World Cup on the pitch for England and be playing in the championship that's amazing amazing feat I could have mentioned some broadcasting moments uh, as well and I'm going to give you one the, the greatest moment Manchester City win the title mm. everybody talks about Martin Tyler's Aguero moment but if you saw that then you miss poor Merson mm. they're piling on top of each other they're giving each other love bites and everything <laughs> I don't know why we say that but yeah. yeah I mean they even had a banner at Man City with that once brilliant yeah. Merce fantastic thank you very much for, for coming in and joining us Pleasure. we've reached the end of this episode of Football's Greatest but don't forget get to look out for part two with Merce when he will be talking about the game's five greatest imports. Last season, Arsenal pushed Man City all the way and if they'd have only looked, if they'd have beat Man City once, they'd have won the league. Saka and Martinelli were unbelievable. Liverpool didn't qualify for the Champions League and he scored more goals than them put together. Thanks very much for joining us. Football's Greatest is a Folding Pocket production with BBC Studios. <laughs>